If my engine was suffering from flooding, one of the first things I'd check is the air filter. Now we can see from this illustration that I've drawn that this air filter is blocked. So there's less airflow allowed through. There's only so much airflow, so there's only a bit of air allowed through. Now the trouble with that is, because there's too little air coming through here, there's too little there to atomize this fuel. So this fuel goes in there in too high a concentrated amounts. And so ultimately when this engine is doing its business going up and down, there's a lot of fuel compared to air going to the top of the piston. And what will happen there ultimately when the piston goes right up to compress everything is that because there's more fuel there than air is all clumped together with less air there to space it out. And because there's less air to space out the fuel, when the spark plug fires or tries to fire, the fuel isn't aerated, it isn't atomized. So it isn't in nice little globules that will allow the heat to get round the little globules. It's hanging around in there now, it's compressed in there as liquid. And as we know, liquid petrol doesn't actually ignite. It has to be atomized with air first in a mist. That, of course, will wet the spark plug and stop the firing of the spark plug. And of course, ultimately, this is what flooding is. And if it's really bad like this, there's no chance that this engine will run or start. So in this case, it's a case of either having a new air filter or if it's a cleanable, serviceable one, it's removing it and giving it a good clean out. And number two, choke. So the next thing I'd look for is, is the choke stuck on? This is the choke butterfly here. And of course that opens and closes. Obviously from a cold start, we want it closed because we want a lot of fuel into the engine just to get things moving. But if it's stuck shut like this, if we try and start it too many times with it shut, or if it starts to close and closes during operation, then the same thing will happen as a blocked air filter. Less air will be able to come through because the choke butterfly there has a tiny little hole allowing only so much air. It does allow a little bit, but not a great lot. And then what would happen, we'd have the same problem again with the flooding and ultimately the same problem there with the liquid fuel rather than the atomized fuel. And that again leads to flooding. And there's a choke butterfly and you can see the hole there that allows so much air in. So we just make sure everything's okay there with the choke, make sure that's not stuck on. And number three, mixture screws. And the next thing I'd look at is the fuel air mixture settings right. This one obviously needs a special tool. Some are just normal screwdriver headed adjusters, but there we are, that's in perspective. If the mixture screw is screwed too far out, it will allow too much fuel to come down here and out into the inlet. Even though there's enough air coming through, and regardless of this, if there's too much fuel allowed through there because of that mixture screw, then we're going to get the same problem there. We're going to get flooding, again resulting in problems. And so number four, spark. Now let's consider spark plug issues or sparking issues. We can see here that all's working correctly. We've got a good flow of air coming through and the engine's working okay. So we've got air coming through, mixing with fuel, everything's going. The fuel and air mixture's being compressed up there nicely and there's a good atomization of fuel there, so a good air to fuel ratio there. So all's looking well. Now although everything is well, and atomization's well there, if there's an insufficient spark, if the spark plug is starting to show its age, or there's a problem with the spark where it's not sparking quite right, then combustion can't take place properly. And ultimately what's gonna happen there, there's gonna start being a buildup of fuel there around the plug. Well, all in this area really, the plug's gonna start getting wet and it's not gonna fire properly. It's gonna make things worse. So if things aren't quite right with the spark plug and it's allowed to continue, let's say if there is a spark but it's not very good, what's gonna happen there? Because there's less combustion taking place, even though there is air coming in with the fuel, the fuel's gonna build up and then we've got a problem with the fuel becoming more of a liquid in there then, rather than atomized. And so this is causing the flooding. And it's the same if this spark plug isn't sparking at all. If we try to start an engine and the spark plug isn't actually sparking at all, then we're gonna get this problem again. Yes, we're gonna get air fuel mixture coming in and even though the air fuel fuel mixture is right to start with, what's going to happen is that again the fuel is going to start building up. And of course, if it's not sparking, it's not going to start anyway, of course. Now number five, oil fuel mixture. Okay, with regards to the oil fuel mixture, if you can see, I've just illustrated the fuel now as dark. And what I'm trying to say by that is that there's too much oil in with the fuel. So that's all I'm illustrating there. Now I've put it in dark.
are. So now what we've got is a good amount of airflow and we've got the air coming in nicely. Everything's open. We're dragging in fuel. Everything's working. But the problem is now that because there's so much oil, it's making it difficult for the engine to combust the fuel that it's mixed with. The reason we put two-stroke oil in the recommended ratios that we do, like 50 to 1 or uh, 30 to 1, whatever the manufacturer recommends, the reason for this is to retain high enough levels of petrol to combust properly. So that's the right mixture. Now, if we put too much oil in there, oil obviously doesn't combust like petrol. So what's going to start happening there? Well, we're going to start getting black smoke for a start. We're going to get incomplete combustion. It's going to create more waste. And also what's going to happen there, because it's not combusting properly, there's going to be a buildup. It's going to start wetting this plug. I've seen this happen before. Mainly this issue results in a lot of smoke. I have seen it where because it can't combust properly, we're getting a wet plug here and it's leading to flooding. And number six, needle valve. I just need to generally go through how they work. So if we could have x-ray vision and look down there at the needle valve, we'd see this, we'd see the lever, the spring, and this is the needle there that can move up and down. And that goes downwards like that and sits on its seat. The fuel comes up this way there. The fuel's going down there to the bottom of this needle valve. So it, it's sitting like that basically. Fuel goes up there to the bottom of the needle valve. That diaphragm there is this metering diaphragm here. And there's the dowel area that pushes back on the lever to allow it to do this. So if everything's working normally and no fuel is being used by the engine, the needle valve will be on its seat because this spring is pushing up on the lever at the back, pushing the needle valve down. And the needle valve is fast on its seat and no fuel can escape into this area and escape into the engine area. The diaphragm, the metering diaphragm is up, so there's nothing pushing down in it at this point. Just to help put that into perspective a little more, that's this view of the carburetor. So you've got the needle valve there and the lever, which are there. And you can see where the fuel comes in from the tank. It comes into the pump area that moves up and down, remember, and forces the fuel that way. We know it can't go that way. So again, in normal operation, when there's no fuel being used, there'll be fuel in this area and there'll be fuel up to the bottom of the needle valve. There will be fuel in there, but it isn't being pumped. So there's no pressure for it to go through and into the inlet area or the venturi area of the carburetor. So there's been nothing drawn into the engine. This is when the engine's not running. Now when the engine's running and this carburetor's in its working state, fuel's coming through and the movement of the piston is driving the fuel pump diaphragm up and down, creating the pressure that way. So there's a pressure under the needle valve ready, but because the engine's using fuel, it's allowed to go through into the engine. It's using fuel out of this area, drawing it out, making a vacuum there for that diaphragm, which is pulling the diaphragm down, pulling the lever down, opening the needle valve, allowing this pressurized fuel to keep going up and through. So that's the working operation. It's doing this. Let's say this is low revs because there's a certain amount of air going through, not too much, and a certain amount of fuel. Engine's at higher revs now, so fuel's coming in even harder. Because the piston's going up and down even faster, the pressure from the pulse line is coming through here as a pressure, vacuum, pressure, vacuum, pressure, vacuum, really fast, moving this even faster more pressure so a greater amount of fuel coming through to allow enough fuel to feed the speed of the engine so you can see there there's lots of air coming through and lots of fuel coming through so it's even going even faster to supply that engine looking in a bit closer detail some of the main problems i've found with flooding and needle valves is normally this lever set too high it's got to be set just right so that when it's not in operation this here isn't really probably touching it more like this here the lever's nice and horizontal and there's a nice distance between the diaphragm and the lever and everything's okay it's all on its seat so any movement of that diaphragm this way will move this lever just right now because this lever's not set right it's too far up touching this diaphragm any movement of this diaphragm even slight it'll be felt there here it'll move this needle valve off its seat too soon and allow fuel into this area too soon and that can affect the engine it can put too much fuel into the engine it's not really regulating the fuel right we can see there just a slight movement of that diaphragm has been enough to make a quite a big gap there to allow lots of fuel into this area more than it should do in its correct operation and that, as I say, can lead to flooding. If we look at this issue here, the lever's set so high that even though this diaphragm hasn't even moved down any, that it's set so high that it's pushing up against the diaphragm with the diaphragm in its normal position and lifting the needle valve off its seat. So the, the diaphragm hasn't even had to come down yet in order to allow lots of fuel in there. Remember, the amount of fuel that goes into this area is regulated through this hole by the pulse line. So the amount of fuel needed to support that engine will be correct in accordance 
compliance with that in normal operation and the needle valve will open at the right times to let the right amount in. The trouble with that is it's letting it all through now even before that's moved. When the engine starts there won't be the same regulation there of the right amount of fuel into the engine. It'll result in too much too soon. But that's easily rectifiable. It's a case of removing the diaphragm, holding down on this bit whilst depressing down on that there just to get the right level. And the right level, the height there is generally set to the same height as this area. So we can get a straight edge across there, put it across from one side to the other, and we can see there that's set correctly because the back of the lever there is touching the ruler. So that's right. So we want this area set right. Whereas that illustration is showing the back of the lever way too high. Another issue I've had in the past is the wrong metering diaphragm. Everything looks right from the shape perspective. I've had them where they fit on properly there like that. No problem whatsoever with the holes correct. But on the underside here, with the area that meets with the lever, that's been too long. Because there's so many different types of diaphragm out there. It's quite easy that, especially if you're buying something second hand of course, that someone might have had the carburetor stripped, tried to repair it and put a diaphragm in that looks right. But there are varying lengths of these dowel areas here that depress the back there, these. And I've had them where they're too long. And of course, if they're too long, we're back to this issue here. Any small movement in the diaphragm is going to open the floodgates, if you like, way too early, leading to flooding. Another problem with the issue of needle valves I've had in the past as well is damaged seats. If the seat's damaged, it doesn't matter how good everything is here. If the lever's working well, the diaphragm's well, the dowel's well, the spring's well, and the needle's well. If the seat is damaged, it's going to leak past. I just wanted to mention something a little further regarding needle valves and seats. If we look at these two here, we can see that on this one, we've got this area here that usually represents the metal or the harder part of the valve. And we've got this part here that I've done in red. That normally represents the softer part of the needle valve that's attached to it, but this is normally like a rubber and it beds into the seat there to create a good seal. And as you can see by this setup, it isn't always the needle valve that has the rubber attached to it. Sometimes the needle valves are all metal or a hardened substance and it's the actual part on the seat that's the softer substance to allow for good seating. And when it comes to seat damage, it's generally the softer part, whether it be on the needle valve or whether it be on the seat, it's generally that softer part that either degrades or is damaged in some way. As you can see with both these illustrations here, fuel can come up and it can seat past both of these because of damage. You can see there that it's not creating a viable seat on either one. And of course, fuel seeping past. Another seating issue there can come from the valve lever spring there. What can happen is if this spring is too weak, then it's not going to push up on that lever hard enough to push down hard enough with the needle valve onto its seat. And then what can happen, obviously then, the fuel pressure that comes up here can actually seep past into this area. More fuel that should do, but not only that, at times when it shouldn't do. And of course that can lead to flooding. So regardless of whether this diaphragm's in the correct place and it's not pushing down on there, because this spring isn't strong enough to hold the back of that lever up and hold that needle down, then the fuel pressure will just keep coming through. Because the needle valve itself and the way all this diaphragm works, as I've explained, helps towards determining the right amount of fuel in here at the right times. If there's any defectiveness leading to weakness on this spring, then it's not going to regulate the fuel properly. Another issue relating to needle valves can be the wrong needle valve. As we can see there, this one's too small to create a seat. It's too thin. It's the wrong type. And I have seen this in carburettors that I've stripped down and had a look at in the past, particularly when I've bought second-hand machines where they've been stripped down before and whoever's rebuilt them has mistakenly put in the wrong needle valve. And since then it's been flooding. So we need to keep a vigil out there to see if it's the right size needle valve that fits into this area. Of course the wrong size needle valve, as I've said, it can't sit properly on this seat here and of course then fuel will seep past. And again then all of this has lost its fuel regulating ability and it can lead to flooding. Just some other causes that I've come across in the past are things like here where the lever pivots. Sometimes there can be excess wear there allowing the lever to move up and down too much and of course if it moves up it's going to lift the valve off its seat. Also I've known where there be slight breaks 
slight damage, fractures if you like, in this lever. And if there is little cracks, let's say there, it would allow for slight bending up at this end here. And that would of course allow the valve to be off its seat slightly. Thankfully, there is a very simple way of testing to see if needle valves are seating right. And the way I've always done it is, whilst there is a proper tool to do this, you can do it without it. And the way I do it is, when the carburetor is actually built up fully, like this, you can imagine it's properly built up now, everything's on, the diaphragms are in, all the lids are on, and it's ready to put on the machine. What I've done in the past is, you can see the fuel pipe coming in there, I put a nice piece of clean fuel pipe on the inlet there, where the fuel goes in, and then I submerge the whole of the carburetor underwater. We can see, I've illustrated it submerged under the water, so we can do this in the bathroom sink or something like that, and we've got to make sure that the piece of clean fuel pipe is poking higher than the top of the water, and then we blow through the tube. And basically what that's doing is blowing air down here, I've illustrated these little dots, all these little dots as air, blows air down here into this area where the fuel would go, and up to the bottom of the seat. And if everything's seating okay there, no air will get past. But if it's not seating, and the air's allowed to get past the needle valve there, it'll actually seep into this area here, as does the fuel, and it'll come out the main jets, and then you'll see it there coming out as bubbles in the surface. So if you do do this, and you do see bubbles coming up, then it will most likely be your needle valve that isn't seating right. And of course then, knowing that the needle valve isn't seating right, you can go ahead then, strip the carburetor, and then just go through all the things I've mentioned to try and diagnose the problem. Finally, number seven, fuel quality. Now something that is a little bit more controversial, and something I have actually had problems with in the past is the quality of fuel and the lack of quality of which that can lead to more insufficient combustion in the engine and sometimes can lead to flooding. Now I've only had this problem a few times because I've always made sure I've got fresh fuel. The theory is what can happen is that when the fuel is stored for too long the more volatile the more combustible component of the fuel starts to evaporate away. It's more reactive and it evaporates into the atmosphere and then what it leaves behind is a less combustible material a less combustible component if you like. It's like a bit thicker, a bit more oily. As I say, that doesn't combust quite as well. And if we've left fuel standing for too long, particularly in machines that haven't been used for a while, I've found it in carburetors, a build-up of this type of fuel here that's had the goodness evaporated away. And it's, it is, it's like a light oil and it's not as combustible. And trying to start the machine on this type of degraded fuel, if you like, just isn't very good and it doesn't combust as well, so it can lead to flooding. In this situation, this needs throwing away. There really is no repair work for this. Even if you were to get some fuel stabiliser, you can't put fuel stabiliser into degraded fuel like this and expect it to bring it back up to standard because it just doesn't. This needs throwing away at this point. I need to get some more better fuel in here, some fresh fuel. So my recommendation is when the fuel, when you've got your fuel, you've just filled up your can and it's good, good fuel, make sure you've got a really, really tight lid and then less can evaporate away. What I always do as well is get a good fuel stabiliser and that can make the fuel stable which keeps this fuel nice and fresh. Now another controversial issue, and I haven't really come across this too much, but what can happen is that because ethanol is added to fuel nowadays, the ethanol inside the fuel can attract moisture. And when the moisture actually gets to the fuel, it falls to the bottom there as water. So if we use this fuel, and we put this fuel into a tank with all this moisture in, there's a chance there that the moisture or the water there can be drawn into the engine. If that's the case, then we're going to reduce the combustion ability of the engine. If this fuel won't combust, again, it's going to lead to flooding. If there's a lot of water in with this fuel, it's going against the oil's ability to lubricate the engine. So to prevent that, we really need to keep, again, a real strong lid tight on your fuel tank. I've had more success keeping my fuel when I've made sure that if I'm storing it for a long time that it's filled right up as high as I can get it and the theory behind that is that there's less air there for this fuel to react with so there's less air there for the reactive components to evaporate into and there's less air there to have moisture in it so it reacts with the ethanol and if we keep a real tight lid there then we know then we're keeping it away from the external environment here so we're keeping it nice and fresh and of course I'd still put a stabiliser in it and just to finish with we don't really know how old our fuel is we might say oh we've just been to the petrol pumps and we've kept the fuel here we might say oh well the fuel I've got is only two weeks old so it's okay it shouldn't be going off but when we think about it, we don't know how long the petrol pumps have actually stored this fuel before we've actually purchased it. So yes, we might have gone yesterday, let's say, and filled up this fuel can, but they may have kept this fuel for days, weeks, or even months. We don't know. So that's the thing about fuel. We can't give an exact time on how long fuel will last once it's been purchased from a petrol station. 
We just can't say how long for those reasons. So at that I just want to thank you so much for looking at my seven possible reasons that can cause flooding in a two-stroke. Thank you for watching.